Drawing is one of the most powerful tools of human expression. It's not only an aid to help us think, but perhaps the most direct way of manifesting a thought, of getting something out of our heads and onto a surface so that it can be recorded. About 10 years ago, I began working on a book about how and why we name and order nature, um, about uh, why and how language has failed me. The basic thesis is that nature is an interconnected and constantly changing system. But in order to communicate that interconnected system through language, we have to, uh, language being possibly the most powerful tool humans have ever invented, we have to take that holistic system and chop it up and label the pieces. And soon, uh, the holistic world uh, becomes uh, fragmented into a series of units that fit into boxes and boundaries are placed between ourselves and things in nature. Uh, it took me a while to realize, but it's actually the failure of words and language that helped um, bring richness uh, and purpose to my life, that helped spark the urge to be creative, to find a way to fill the spaces in between where words couldn't go. Um, and it was in part knowledge of an older form of communication that I'd been doing since childhood uh, that brought this inquiry about in my head, uh, a, a, a form of communication that could be considered almost a window into a more elemental human self, and that's uh, drawing. Uh, I'd like to start with this image. It's possibly the most iconic image ever drawn by a scientist, if not the most important. It's Darwin's drawing, uh, the first drawing he ever made of the evolutionary tree of life. He had just returned from a five-year trip around the world on the boat known as the Beagle. And uh, he sat down at his desk, and he was trying to synthesize his thoughts about this big idea, evolution, that all animals and all life on Earth was descended from common ancestry on a great evolutionary timeline. It looks kind of like a stick figure gone wrong, but uh, it's, it's actually such a simple but such an important idea Perhaps um, its simplicity is what makes it so beautiful. It, it turned all ideas about why we are here and how we got here on our heads. And he did it uh, through a drawing. Um, he may as well have uh, said in a version of Descartes, I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore I draw. If you can see, he wrote, I think, up there. <laughs> or I draw, therefore I think. Or I can't think unless I draw. Or maybe, I draw, therefore I am, which I think will be a theme of this talk uh, going forward. The idea that the first time humans make mar made marks consciously was the first time that they became or helped them become sentient, self-aware um, animals. I thought about uh, calling this talk, Why We Draw, but then I realized that not everybody does draw, although uh, most of us start drawing as children and then stop, and I'd like to explore that a little bit later. Uh, then I thought maybe I would call it why I draw, as uh, there's nothing I've been doing longer in my life than drawing. I drew before I could write my own name and before I could form complete sentences. But then I, what I really wanted to be about was more about why I think we should draw, drawing as a tool for helping us develop ideas um, for helping us internalize our environments, helping us slow down and pay attention, almost like a form of meditation in this uh, hyper-technological age that we live in, to slow down, to help us uh, observe our surroundings. Um, I grew up in uh, southwestern Connecticut, not far from here, and I was introduced to nature through my father's love of birds. Uh, I began drawing birds as a child, uh, copying the works of John James Audubon and Luis Agassiz Fuertes and Roger Torrey Peterson. So I was drawing from nature already processed by other individuals through, through, the, through their minds. But then I also had access to raw nature itself, in this case, a magnolia warbler that had flown into the window of our home and died. And my father wasn't afraid to pick it up and put it in my hand. And, um, you know, that was a very formative moment for me, holding this beautiful, unfortunately dead thing in my hand, but it filled me with a sense of wonder. 
Um, this is an early drawing uh, of a warbler. Uh, soon after that, my, um, around the age of nine, my drawings morphed from birds into fish when I fell in love with fishing, and in particular, a beautiful fish of cold water streams called the trout. Uh, in particular, even more so, the brook trout, which is the native trout of Connecticut that has lived in our streams since the last glaciation. They're some of the most beautiful creatures, uh, in my opinion, that I've certainly ever seen. And um, I wanted to capture them through drawing, because that's what I did. Uh, my passion for trout was so intense, it's hard for me to describe. Um, it, it resulted in two books of paintings of trout of North America and Europe, Asia, and North Africa. I spent uh, seven years traveling around the world looking for native trout. That was much later. But typically what I would do on, in any spare moment was go out on the stream near my home, uh, catch a fish, make sketches of the fish, and uh, usually take photographs too because I like to let the fish go alive. And the colors fade very quickly after you take the fish out of the water. So because I wanted to draw them, uh, these were very good aids to me for looking at the colors. Then I'd go back to my home, and I'd typically sit at the desk in my bedroom. I'd draw uh, the outline of the fish in graphite, and then start filling it in with watercolors. And at that point, I realized something strange started to happen. I began to um, have these almost visions, like lucid dreaming, where I was reliving a moment on the stream, even though I wasn't there, that somehow drawing had, um, had brought about this um, resurrection of a very vivid memory. I could feel the, the warmth of the sun. I could see the, um, the stream going by, feel the, or hear the buzz of a fly by my face, smell the flowers in the air. And um, I began to think about why this happened, because I also would write about um, my experiences in my journal since I was 11 years old. I was so intensely into fishing that on days I didn't go fishing, I wrote, no fishing. There were more days that I fished than didn't fish. Um, but in any case, uh, when I wrote in my journal about the experiences, the same thing didn't happen. So it was something uh, unique to drawing. And then when I went back out on the stream, I felt like the experience of drawing the trout had made me more efficient at catching them, um, a more efficient predator, so to speak, even though I didn't kill the fish, but that, that somehow drawing the trout had uh, made it exist in my body and my brain, had integrated myself with the environment in a way that was almost kind of magical. And then when I um, first encountered these uh, drawings of animals on cave walls, um, I don't know, in some publication somewhere, and read how old they were in, in France and Spain at sites like Lascaux and Chauvet made, they think, 40,000 years ago, I felt like I had some idea. We have no idea why they were made, of course, because the people are, have been long dead. Uh, many, many people have speculated. But I felt like I had some idea about why perhaps they were um, drawn and why perhaps um, people still drew because if I'd had this experience where I was drawing the animal I was pursuing and it had such a profound effect on me and it made me a better observer of my surroundings, it helped hone my skills of observation, that maybe drawing was a tool that helped these people get to know their surroundings better and then once they made a drawing of the creature even if you weren't the person who made the drawing, it gave a, a platform for other people to communicate that thing when it wasn't even in the room. Think about how powerful that is. If you have a drawing of a cow or something like these or whatever kind of cow-like creature they, they were, possibly extinct creatures now, um, if you have a drawing, you have a, a platform through which you can communicate that thing. A drawing in this sense is almost like a word and um, and because drawing predates written language, uh, drawing is the ancient ancestor of written language, written language came out of drawing, and drawing possibly even predates complex spoken language, then drawing may have been the first word, essentially, the first um, way to communicate. It's, it's like saying the word cow. If I say the word cow, you can all close your eyes and conjure up a cow in your heads. Um, and that's a pretty, pretty powerful thing. It's almost like sorcery. You can bring the animal into the context of the room without it even being there or some imaginary semblance of it. 
So I felt like, um, you know, the drawing was this perhaps first most powerful way of communication. Uh, and then that way, maybe the writers of the Bible had it wrong in the beginning wasn't the word, I think, in the context of human evolution. And the beginning was the drawing. Uh, I've seen some of these rock drawings in person. This is in Zimbabwe. People were very resourceful in how they were made. Uh, we were told that these were made um, by using uh, sometimes antelope blood or semen or the urine as a binder of the pigment, the ochre pigments, or um, the urine of an ancestor of an elephant called a hyrax. Uh, but they're extremely beautiful, these giraffe drawings in Zimbabwe. This is a drawing um, from Thermopolis, Wyoming, where they used a, a rock to peck out uh, the drawing on the rock with another two rocks. And these are thought to be thousands of years old. Um, going to these sites and standing in front of them has filled me with great wonder, like, like you do standing in front of a great work of art, like a Van Gogh or a Da Vinci. Because I believe that, um, that when you stand in front of a work of art, you are, uh, that the energy of the person who made it is still sort of part of that work. And when you stand in front of it, even thousands of years later, you're engaged in a kind of time machine of the mind. Um, and this led me to think about or to ask, what were the first marks that we made consciously as humans and why? And, and, and I thought, well, we must have definitely taken our cues from nature. Perhaps what inspired us to draw originally were the footprints of animals in the snow, like these fox prints in my backyard, or the lines drawn by a blade of grass as the wind blows it over a dune in the sand in Cape Cod. Or maybe it was the after image of the sun when you gaze at the, at the sun, which you shouldn't do for too long. It'll burn your eyeballs. Um, and then you close your eyes and you have that beautiful after image of the sun on your eyes. Um, perhaps that gave us some indication of, you know, making a mark. Or maybe it was the power of a reflection on a lake. Uh, because we don't think about how amazing and unique an idea that is or a thing that nature does. It takes a three-dimensional world and it converts it to a two-dimensional surface for you. Um, which is what artists try to do. They take, they take the three-dimensional world and they convert it to a two-dimensional surface, whether it's a piece of paper or canvas or a piece of rock. Another reflection on the pond across the street from my home. Or maybe it was some other mark uh, made by animals in nature. They're certainly abundant. Uh, these are uh, eggs laid by different seabirds and other kinds of birds. Uh, when an egg starts in the body of a female uh, bird, uh, it's white, and then as it passes out of the oviduct of the bird, little, essentially, inkjet printers in the oviduct make these little marks on the eggs, and they're beautiful. There's some speckled and some, uh, you know, squiggly ones, and you could, or I at least, think they're quite remarkable and beautiful, and I consider them a kind of drawing. Uh, if you do, then you would say that these um, eggs were drawn on by a female grackle, the bird that laid them. And these in particular bear a remarkable resemblance to the work of a, a little known artist named Jackson Pollock. Um, and you wonder, you know, Pollock lived in eastern Long Island uh, near the beach. He undoubtedly took a lot of walks along the beach. And he probably saw the, the eggs of uh, different seabirds. Uh, so, you know, whether um, it may be coincidence, this resemblance, but um, whether Pollock was inspired. Uh, by the bird, or the bird was inspired by Pollock. Um, I'm not so sure, but I'd venture to say that uh, if, if I had to guess which came first, Pollock or the egg, that it was the bird. Um, so nature, we can be pretty sure, um, was the first scribe. So what first humanoid was it that first saw the power, realized the power in imitating these things that happen in nature? whether it was the courtship of birds that we mimic in our dances or bird song in our speech. Um, when we had first made a mark as a human on a wall or wherever, we had um, not only uh, sort of, we weren't just copying a gesture made by nature, we discovered a method. And this method was a revelatory method. It's so simple. But I think it was one of the biggest ideas of all time. Think about 
what that does. It's, it, it's a way of pausing and recording time. All these gestures left behind by animals, you know, fox prints in the snow or lines in the sand drawn by grass, they're ephemeral, they're slippery, just like thoughts and, and memories. They're washed away by the rain and the wind. But if we can make a mark that actually lasted in a place that was protected by the elements, and that that mark could be communicated to another human being, um, that was extremely powerful. It was, it was a way of acknowledging our own um, existence on the planet. And, um, and probably uh, these people liked doing that too because they may have acknowledged that they died and it was a way of leaving a piece of themselves behind. Um, the first drawings, I would imagine, probably looked something like this. Uh, this is a, a, an image of a hand on a cave wall in Sulawesi, Indonesia, thought to be about 40,000 years old, made probably by somebody taking some pigment in their mouth and blowing it through a straw um, uh, around their hand to leave a negative image. And again, this, this kind of image, I find it very haunting looking, but it was, it was a way of kind of saying, I am here, or here I am. This is a, a cave in Argentina they call the Cuevo de Manos, I think, the Cave of Hands. It's, it's, a, it's a really arresting image, and it's like they're shouting out, here I am, here I am, I'm here, I'm on the planet. And it's, it's very much, uh, now looking back on it, it, like Darwin's little simple image of the tree of life, an acknowledgement of where humans came from and, and this great ancestral uh, lineage that we're part of. Uh, contemporary artists um, still use this simple imagery to this day. This is a work by the British artist Richard Long, handprints in a circle. Um, and this is an image by an artist named Joel Shapiro made by, with fingerprints. It almost looks like a digital drawing. Uh, this is a close-up of that image. Uh, these are the footprints of my son, four-month-old son, Cody, minutes after he was born. These marks are uh, sometimes called by academics indexical marks. They're individual to every human being, and that's partly what makes a drawing powerful, that it's a mark of a single person. And even if we all you know, drew a straight line on a piece of paper and we handed them out to everybody, you would see the differences. That's why I kind of lament uh, the fading away of, of cursive handwriting and other ways of handwriting, because it's so special to get like a letter in the mail or something like that, as opposed to a text email, which is also great and efficient. But, but I lament the sort of end of those individualistic, beautiful ways of communicating. Um, I still draw to this day. Uh, this is me in the studio. Um, I draw at home and I draw on trips around the world in the midst of different inquiries. Uh, this is, uh, was on a trip to Suriname as part of this project I'm working on about naming and ordering nature, a collecting trip to Suriname with the Peabody Museum at, uh, at Yale. <laughs> Uh, this is um, a snake that we collected, and uh, there's me drawing the snake, uh, and this is a toucan. Uh, I sometimes wonder how it is that these tools that I use to communicate um, are still relevant, being that they're so ancient and really haven't changed in thousands of years. Um, a pencil uh, with graphite, something that's mined from the ground, an animal hair brush with a wood handle or a piece of charcoal from the fire pit in my backyard can still make a very um, wonderful drawing. How has this technology persisted to this day in the face of all the alternative technologies we have? Photography, uh, type, written, lang written language, excuse me, or, um, or the, you know, all the other things we have, iPhones and things. Um, I still draw because it's a way for me to connect with my surroundings. Uh, this, a drawing I made on a trip to the Scottish Highlands, and if I hadn't sat down in this landscape uh, to draw this picture, if I'd just taken a picture with my iPhone and walked away, I wouldn't remember the landscape. It wouldn't be as internalized in myself as it was because I sat there, and I can still remember looking at this drawing, uh, the, the, the sound of the stream and the, the trout jumping in the stream, the midges biting the crap out of me, the sheep, you know, roaming by and smelling their dung. Um, this is me at around two years old drawing, but 
just as a way to sort of start wrapping up the talk, uh, we all start drawing as children and then we stop. And I wonder why that is. Is it, is it because we're told by our teachers that a drawing has to look like something and then if it doesn't, they take it and tear it up and throw it away? That would be a pretty bad teacher. Um, but I think uh, I'm not just selling drawing here uh, as a means to an end, as a way of having something, a result that looks like something. Obviously, abstract expressionism threw out the idea that a drawing has to resemble something uh, in, our, in our worlds. Um, I'm selling drawing more as a process that helps us connect with nature to um, slow down, to pay attention, as I mentioned before, as a kind of meditation. Um, I've been working on a body of work, uh, I'll end with this image, uh, where I do these murals of bird silhouettes on walls, and they're kind of like the images that the early people painted on cave walls, uh, just silhouettes of animals um, on a surface. And the point of these pieces is that the source material uh, are these old field guides where there's silhouettes of birds or animals with numbers, and the numbers match up to a list of names to help us identify things in the field. So when I paint them, I paint the animals and the numbers, but I leave out the key, so there's no way that people can satisfy their urge to know what the names are, and then they get frustrated. And that's because I feel that sometimes we live too much in the world of language and labels, and it's just a, a, an acknowledgement there's other forms of communication that can be just as powerful, like drawing. Thank you. Mm -hmm.